Hello, I'm Darren Hanson, Executive Director of the Centre for Strategic Leadership at the NUS Business School. I'm joined today by Vineet Nair, Vice Chairman of HCL Technologies, one of the world's largest IT services companies. He's also the author of the best-selling book, Employees First, Customers Second. Uh, welcome, Vineet. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Vineet, it's great to have you here. One of the questions I wanted to ask you was, uh, was about trust in your organisation and transparency. You mentioned it a lot. How do you go about actually developing trust and transparency within HCL? I think the first step to any decision is to find the reason why. And if you want to build a fast growing organization which is well aligned, uh, to get that trust going is very, very critical because if there's no trust between the management and the employees, there'll be no trust between the customers and our employees. The first step towards, and there are very many ways you can build trust, but in my experiments, what I have discovered is that transparency will trust. So if you are transparent about data, which the employees do not believe you would normally share, if you're transparent about your inefficiencies, inadequacies, as much about your strengths, putting everything out there in the open results in employees started feeling that I can trust this person, I can trust this organization, because they are so transparent. So once you get trust, then employees work harder for the overall purpose of the organization, you grow faster. Why do you think it is typically that senior managers are so resistant to this transparency? I think the way we have grown up uh, over a period of time, you know, most of the senior management have spent more than 25 years in their career. They come from an organization culture where security, sensitivity on security issues were becoming very, very important. Now, what they started imbibing was that the sensitivity and security issues were to do with IP uh, and ideas and not to do with the relationship with the employees. So the distrust they had for their competition started slowly coming into their culture of thinking and doing everything and started coming into not trusting the employee uh, with data, with transparency. The second thing which really happened, which unfortunately happened, is that people started taking the easy route. You believe what I call the five second manager, the guy who will try and sell your dream, right? The shoe salesperson. Now more and more managers found it easier to take some data, slice it and dice it because they are extremely intelligent and try and sell a yarn uh, to these kids uh, who would potentially believe in because your stature is of a general manager or a CEO. Over a period of time, the Generation Y started coming in and started researching more. More and more social networks started coming together. The data became transparent, the truth became known, people became connected, and the lie was detected. And that the moment the lie was detected, uh, the trust started eroding. And these guys at the management level did not realize that their trust was getting eroded, but it was irreversibly damaged. So people did not realize that the social networking, which has really come in in a very big way over the last seven, 10 years, has actually taken the truth to be the center stage of evolution of thinking of the Gen Y and what they think about the management. And therefore, you cannot hide. Now, I know that you've worked extensively all around the world. You travel constantly. Have you noticed a lot of difference between Asia and the West in terms of developing trust and transparency in their organizations? This question is often asked to me, and my answer is no, it's just an excuse. Uh, and the reason I say it's an excuse is because if you're playing football or soccer, whatever you call it, and you have the ball with you, and there are 21 other players in the field, you don't think about the fact that he's a Korean or a Singaporean or a German or an Indian or an American. You do what's right, and that is true with business. Business is about simple things, getting them right every time. And therefore, the cultural differences on basic human values of trust, of transparency, of integrity, of trusting people, giving them an opportunity, encouraging them to do what they really want to do, are, are basic principles and they, they span across cultures. You mentioned also the process of inverting the pyramid of having supporting functions and management reporting to employees. Um, why is that so important and how does it work in practice? Let's step back and say why is that important. Uh, what is the core business of any company? to grow faster than competition. How can it grow faster than competition? By creating differentiated value for the customer compared to what the, what the competition can create. Where does this differentiated value get created, especially in the services business? It gets created in the interface of the employees and the customer. Let's call that the value zone. So what we are saying in these three steps is that the core business of any business is to create differentiated value and the differentiated value is created by the customers in the value zone. So then you fundamentally ask the question, if that is true, then what is the core business of managers and management in any company? 
and the logical argument is to enthuse, encourage, enable those employees in the value zone to create the differentiated value so that you can grow faster. Now, then you come to the question, how do you do it? Now, the only way to do that is because if that is the value zone, then the management has to report to the value zone. So you have to invert the pyramid. You have to invert two pyramids. You have to invert what I call the God's pyramid. God's pyramid is all the enabling functions who have become gods over a period of time because they are the only honest people and they are preventing somebody else to run away with company's money or secrets or whatever it is and therefore they have, they have taken over the mantle of being the control functions. So they were enabling, they are called enabling functions but they have over a period of time wrongly so assumed the control mandate. And the management, which is also taking all the decisions which are needed, and they are not following the basic principles of the fact, they actually, if they start enthusing, encouraging, enabling, and take 500 decisions rather than 50 decisions, they'll grow faster. So, so the experiments we started doing at HCL is saying, how do we can invert the pyramid at the management end, and how do we invert the pyramid at the enabling end? At the management end, we adopted the tool called the 360 degree survey. We digitalized it. My appraisal is done by about 87,000 employees across HCL, 32 countries, and the results are published on the web for all employees to see. So by making our 360 degree appraisal uh, available for all employees to give, we inverted the pyramid and created the trust which was needed. The enabling function was a little difficult because it was not just about rating them, it is about transactionally feeling enabled rather than feeling disabled. And what we did was we wrote a digital software where as an employee you can open a trouble ticket on enabling function. So the moment you open a ticket, an HR or a finance runs to close it in a certain period of time. But the bonus of these enabling functions is not based on the speed at which you saw the transaction. It is based on the fact that the transaction should not have existed in the first instance. The moment we did that, all the enabling functions today, before launching any initiative, try very hard to try and get people motivated about that scheme, to get buy-in from the scheme. So before they launch the scheme, there is a huge amount of collaboration and consensus building. And the result is awesome. The result is HCL is growing faster than all the in industry put together. We are beating the industry averages and uh, we've grown about you know, seven times in the last seven years. I imagine there's a lot of CEOs who will be very nervous about that degree of openness. Um, how would you go about convincing organizations that th this is a better approach? That's a very interesting question and uh, I truly believe that CEOs are very smart, right? So the question is when you want to transform your company, what choices do you have? You have a choice of innovating on what you do. The Japanese showed us that actually it's not what you do, but how you do it could also be the innovation axis. So the Japanese car makers, when they started manufacturing the process of Kaizen methodology, just in time, all this stuff came in in the 80s. They started competing with the American car makers and did a pretty good job, not on the what they produced, but how they produced it. So the question every CEO needs to ask today is, can by evolving a new culture, and investing all your strategic dollars in the human capital and the return on human capital by making employee first, can you grow faster than your competition? The moment they see that connection, the moment they see the fact that by putting employee first, it's a strategy to grow faster. It's not an HR strategy, it is a strategy to grow faster. And it has the same level of risk associated with any new product launch or any new market. The moment that dot gets connected, I think the CEOs will get it. So they're not scared. They need to understand why they need to do it. One last question, if I may. Um, you mentioned in your book that perhaps we should be moving the responsibility for change in an organization out of the CEO's office and down to the employees. That must make a lot of CEOs very nervous. I am not sure it makes nervous. See, what really happens is that if you imagine the dining table in your homes, the way the dining table conversations have evolved from my days where my father used to tell what needs to be done and we as a family would do it. And today there it needs to be a lot of consensus building in the dining table for the family to do that thing. Whether it's going to a movie or a restaurant, everybody has an equal uh, share in the voice. Now the management style in this new culture is more of collaboration, is more of transferring the ownership. When you go back to office, why do you forget that the life has changed, right? You have to go to back office and saying that it's the same teenagers who are coming to your office. And these guys do not want instructions. They want a problem to fix. They get excited by a problem. 
So why do you assume that the employees get excited by how great the company is? They get excited by how bad it is because then they get an opportunity of fixing it. So if you transfer the control of change to the employees and saying you're the only guys who can fix it and we have a problem, you will get suddenly get a very excited workforce who is in the business of solving your problem. Mm -hmm. Otherwise you keep on telling them how great you are and everybody relaxes because there's nothing to fix. Mm -hmm. So transferring this change and the ownership of change to the employees is a logical step mm -hmm. to be able to create, increase the energy level of the organization and run faster. Philippe Nair, thank you very much for taking time out of your very busy schedule to speak with us today. Thank you.